Hello class, this is Demetrius Wilson. This is Management 2. We are now on Chapter 8, Managing Human Resources and Organizations. Our learning outcomes for Chapter 8 are describe the environmental context of human resource management, uh, discuss how organizations attract human resources, including human resource planning, recruiting, and selecting, uh, describe how organizations develop human resources, including training and development, discuss how organizations maintain human resources, discuss the nature of diversity, describe labor relations, and describe the issues associated with managing knowledge and contingent and temporary workers. Uh, so the holiday season is coming up. A lot of times uh, Macy's will come a calling and say, hey, uh, we have uh, a lot of job jobs open because uh, we have contingent workers. We need more people to be staffed for the holidays, uh, but they don't need those people the entire year. Uh, so, quote, they have no company for old-fashioned management, right? So anything that requires knowledge and service gives us a reason to be, right? So uh, be sure to, to check out Management in Action. Uh, always gives you a good uh, backdrop story in terms of, of uh, you know, a real-life uh, management situation that can either help you or, or help you to learn what to do uh, in the near or distant future. Uh, so be sure to go over that. Uh, human resource management is a set of organizational activities directed at attracting, right? So we want to attract the right people. Then when we have those people, we want to develop those individuals and then maintain an effective workplace because we don't want problems uh, uh, to occur in our workplace. Uh, human capital, just like, uh, you know, you say like human resources, human capital or capital that you have, uh, capital equipment, you have capital in terms of people. Uh, reflects the organization's investment in attracting retaining and motivating an effective workforce so like I said you attract them but then you also want to retain them right you don't want your company to be a revolving door people come in and then they leave immediately you want them to stay and have some longevity there uh, and and make it a effective workplace not only a, a workplace in which people get along but also an effective workplace because you need to get things done uh, the legal environment of human resource management so I want you guys to review this on your own equal uh, employment opportunity all uh, right, talks about uh, Title VII, age discrimination, uh, pregnancy discrimination, all of these different things, uh, you know, that, that some of us, uh, myself included, have, uh, you know, have, have run into instances, uh, you know, related to these, uh, sometimes not necessarily on the right end. And I'll give you guys a, you know, a story about that uh, either in this section or, or the next. Uh, the read through this, uh, compensation and benefits as well, like what we should, what should we be compensating people, what type of benefits should we provide? Look at labor relations, talks about, uh, you know, the history of that. Sorry about that. And then health and safety. Every time you say health and safety, uh, OSHA comes up with the Occupational uh, Safety and Health Act. Um, you should have someone who, who, you know, deals with things in terms of the company and, and, and OSHA uh, to make sure everything's safety, uh, safety compliant and uh, nobody's getting hurt. Uh, if you work somewhere like a, a warehouse, which I have before, uh, you, you'll see a lot of things uh, going on that, that, you know, that you have to have because you want to ensure uh, that, that people are safe in the environment. Otherwise, you know, they're going to get hurt. You're going to get sued. and It's not going to be good for, uh, for your company. So I'm not going to go through all of the different, uh, you know, uh, Title VII Civil Rights Act and everything, but I do want you guys to, you know, read through, understand what they are and understand the history behind them. Uh, so you have the Title VII Civil Rights Act, uh, Adverse impact, I'll, I will read that one. So when minority group members meet or pass a selection standard at a rate less than 80% of the pass rate or majority uh, group members, right? So you can have an adverse effect, like say if you have something that in one of the terms that will come up uh, about affirmative action, it's quite possible that, uh, you know, you end up having some reverse discrimination and then uh, now you have a, some adverse impact and that diversity group that you were trying to get in is now the majority. Uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, uh, you might want to you know, even look up a, um, a video on them because they have some really nice videos out that just kind of explain what they do as an organization, but they enforce uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. Uh, so they you know, ensure that you know, people's civil rights are not being violated. Uh, age discrimination, that just means that, you know, people are being discriminated in terms of their age. Uh, you know, some people say, they look at resumes and say, hey, I, this first resume is five pages long. Uh, I can tell how old they are. I'm not going to hire them because sometimes people don't want to hire older people because they're, <clears throat> they may be setting their ways and they, they figure if they hire someone younger, uh, it's easier to teach and, teach and train them. Uh, but, you know, the, for me, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, sometimes it's just, you know, a generalization. 
Uh, but uh, if somebody's uh, older than 40, uh, you know, it's some things and some questions are going to come up. And I, I personally have been accused of age discrimination in the hiring process before and had to go to HR. Uh, but luckily, I had my uh, paperwork straight and had a rationale as to why I didn't hire this internal individual and, uh, you know, and avoided that. So and I definitely wasn't discriminating against this person because of age. I hired somebody older than them. They were just, you know, a little salty because I didn't hire that individual. Affirmative action. This is intentionally seeking and hiring qualified or uh, qualifiable uh, employees, right? So qualified means like you already have the qualifications. Qualifiable means we can get, you know, you're a person that can get the qualifications uh, from racial, sexual, and ethnic groups that are underrepresented in the organization. Uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, right? You know, there, there are certain things that you have to have for people who are disabled in terms of parking space, in terms of you know, being able to get into an elevator or a lift that, that rises them up to the second floor. So uh, just things that you, you know, need to be cognizant of, uh, especially if you are a manager. Now, Civil Rights Act of 1991, uh, that amends original Civil Rights Act, so you can read that. Fair Labor Standard Act, uh, Equal Pay Act of 1963. Touch on that one for a second. Uh, requires that men and women be paid the same amount for doing the same job. Uh, a lot of people like, hey, you know, men are always, you know, paid more if they're doing the exact same thing. Uh, but I've watched a video uh, that actually shows, you know, why and how the, you know, it's really not as big a gap. Now, in some instances, it definitely is, but in some instances, it's not. And, and some of the reasons uh, why it's it's not, uh, and, and, and sometimes when women make less, they have to do with things such as not negotiating for a higher salary during the process, and, and you know, men are typically... Well, everybody's taught to do so, uh, but uh, but a lot of times uh, uh, women don't end up doing it, uh, even though even though they should uh, they should do it. So everybody should you know know how to negotiate. Uh, but if you don't ne negotiate for the right amount initially, then you're already behind the eight ball in terms of what you're getting paid. Uh, Employment uh, a Retirement Income Security Act or ERISA, uh, Family Medical Leave Act. Uh, you need to read that one. Oh, uh, well, I'll read it. Family or uh, FMLA, uh, more known as. Uh, so requires employee employers to provide up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave uh, for family and medical emergencies. Because people do have family and medical emergencies. Uh, you know, they go out for certain sicknesses, illnesses, or their family does, and they need to use those days. Uh, now, some people abuse it. Yes, they definitely do. Uh, but but some people uh, actually need those days. Uh, National Labor uh, Relations Act, go ahead and read that one uh, on your own as well. National Labor Relations Board, Labor Management Relations Act, right? Uh, Occupational uh, Safety and Health Act also uh, directly mandates the provision of safe uh, working conditions. Well, you, if you don't work in, in you know, a place with chemicals and stuff like that, maybe you don't experience like why you really need such a safe work, ex work experience. But, um, but I, I've seen it before. Um, a guy was giving me an example. Of, uh, of like kind of like an assembly line set up and um, I guess they were dealing with certain chemicals and ammonia and they mixed too much and he said when it got up to the top assembly line he said the, they didn't have proper ventilation either the ladies you know it was like five of them up there that were supposed to be working with that chemical they soon they sniffed it and smelled it uh, not that they sniffed it like you know on purpose but you know the, the odor and it came up there they all just you know simultaneously like just fell out and passed out right so that's something that OSHA would you know, would definitely look at. I've been at companies before where we've called OSHA, and OSHA's come in to look at our company and tell us uh, what we need to do better, uh, which sometimes is a, a good uh, preemptive strike uh, when you're speaking of OSHA. Uh, job analysis is a systemized procedure for collecting and recording information about jobs within an organization, right? So we want to analyze a job. We want to figure out who's doing it, why they're doing it, what they're supposed to be doing, what they're not doing that they're supposed to be doing. And then, uh, you know, from that job analysis, that's when you get your uh, job description and, and everything. So it has to, you have to do the analysis first, right? Don't be lazy and not do the analysis and just say, oh, yeah, this, here's the job description. You do the job analysis, you may need to add to the job description. And you may also need to subtract uh, from the current job description as well. Uh, forecasting human resource demand and supply. So just think about that when I talked about Macy's. You have to forecast how many people do we need on the floor to sell these suits, right? Uh, we were obviously going to need more than we need in August. Uh, we're obviously going to need, uh, you know, more than we uh, maybe need in July. Uh, but that, that prime time from the, uh, the day after Thanksgiving to, you know, the close to New Year's, it's a lot of shopping uh, going on during that period. So 
you know, a place like Macy's, when you talk about forecasting human resource demand and supply, they're forecasting that they're going to need a lot of other individuals. So they're probably starting to call around now and say, hey, it's the holiday season. You know, you worked here last year. Can you come down and assist us and uh, make pretty good, uh, pretty decent money? Uh, so if you look at this before we get to the actual figure 8.1, what kind of gives you a breakdown? Uh, you want to assess trends in external labor markets, current employees, future organizational plans, general economic trends. So you want to predict demand, right? So you're going to predict your actual demand of how many, you know, your, your company, how many employees you demand. Then you want to forecast internal supply and forecast external supply. Compare future demand and internal supply. So maybe you're five people off. We need to hire five people. And then plan for dealing with predicted shortfalls or overstaffing, right? So sometimes there's shortfalls. Uh, where you don't have enough people, sometimes it's overstaffing where you have too many people. Uh, so human resource planning is uh, attracting human resources uh, cannot be left to chance if an organization expects to function at peak efficiency. Human resource planning involves assessing trends, forecasting supply and demand of labor, and then developing appropriate strategies uh, for addressing any differences, right? So when you see your variance, then you need to address uh, your specific variance. So when you look at this, it's called a replacement chart. Uh, also could be called a succession planning, depends on what textbook you're looking at. Uh, but it lists each important managerial position in the organization, who occupies it, how long he or she will probably remain in the position, and who uh, will be the qualified replacement, right? So uh, you should have some type of succession planning to say that, hey, you know, we have this individual in this position, but uh, but we're gonna that, that probably person probably gonna get promoted, go somewhere else. And so we need somebody to come, you know, per, they say per off the bench and just and and uh, I'll take that person's position. Uh, <clears throat> so employee information system or skills inventory uh, contains information on each employee's educational skills or education, their skills, experience and career aspirations, usually computerized. Uh, my company has something like that. Uh, it's good for companies that have that because when people start looking for someone to fill a position, then they're looking, they're saying, hey, you know what? This is the individual that we think is going to be able to fill this position. Uh, so it's, it's good to actually have those out there. Uh, if you don't have it, then how are people going to look out and say, you know, hey, Demetrius Wilson is a qualified individual for this position. Uh, you know, they're not going to, you know, put their fingers to their forehead and, and you know, be clairvoyant and just find you. Uh, recruiting is the process of attracting individuals to apply for jobs that are open, right? So we're going to recruit the correct type of individuals. Jobs are open, please apply, and then we'll vet it out and see if you're the appropriate individual for the job. Uh, internal recruiting, right? So just like it sounds, uh, considering uh, current employees as applicants for higher level jobs in the organization, right? So I, I know this individual, he doesn't need to be trained on the systems or anything like that. Let's go ahead and hire him. Uh, it shortens up our training and development period, and that person can kind of get to work. But, you know, you can also fall in the pit, you know, pitfall or trap that says, hey, this is not the best individual. But just because you don't want to train anybody means that you're not going to get them. It's so funny, a company I work for, they will not hire anybody who hasn't already previously worked on the system that we use at our company, which is absolutely terrible because that means you can only hire people that left the company and people that got fired or people from another, you know, from another department. But you can't hire anybody and that's their policy that hasn't already used the system why because the system is so old and antiquated that they, they don't want to take the time to train somebody new uh, external recruiting getting people from the outside of the organization to apply for jobs uh, and that, that definitely makes sense uh, sometimes external recruiting is, is definitely the way uh, the way to go you need some fresh blood in there uh, to, uh, to kind of come in and reinvigorate everything as opposed to the same old people there a realistic job preview that provides the applicant with a real picture of what it would be like to perform the job that the organization is trying to fill, right? Pretty good. Know what you're actually getting into. Uh, and then validation, uh, determining uh, the extent to which the selection device is really predictive of the future job performance, right? Because maybe uh, what you're coming up with, your math, uh, your predictions, your forecast, maybe it's not uh, fully accurate. So you always have to ensure that you validate so anybody who does like a lot of statistics or business statistics knows that validation is key <clears throat> uh, you have tests right so sometimes companies give the uh, Meyer Briggs test the Wonderlick test different things uh, that you can you, you can take to see if you're, you're the individual that they want uh, they do interviews of course uh, you know there are a lot of great YouTube videos out there on how to be successful in your interviews 
uh, assessment centers, uh, like I said, with the testing they can assess you and other different techniques to see if you are the proper quality individual for their organization. Uh, training and development, uh, there's a video in there on that, uh, very key. Uh, training is teaching operational or technical employees how to do their job uh, for which they're hired, right? So how do you, you know, do your job, uh, give that actual training. And then development is tre uh, teaching managers and professionals the skills needed uh, but for both present and future jobs, right? So we see you as the, you know, president later on down the road. Let me give you, uh, you know, an overview of these type of skills that I think that you need or I know that you need in order to be successful in that actual position. Uh, Darden Invest in Employee Development. So check that out. This is actually a really good story. Um, you know, uh, not this particular, well, this this is a great story, but also I, I read an article to a different class about uh, this, this individual who said, hey, you know, we don't know what's going on with these restaurants. Like we're going to, you know, um, Red Lobster and Olive Garden, things like that. And, and, and we're saying, hey, we, we don't know how to fix it. And some of these guys that came in as, as the top people in the company said, you know what, we're going to be waiters, we're going to be servers, and we're going to see, actually go in and see how to fix it. Because, you know, we can't fix everything from way up there on the ivory tower. Sometimes we have to go down to the very nitty gritty, figure out how it's done, and then go ahead and fix it. So uh, be sure to read that story, uh, this story right here. It's a you know, great one, <clears throat> very successful. Uh, performance appraisal. People are going to need a performance appraisal. Uh, it's a formal assessment of how well an employee is doing on his or her job. Uh, and, and people need to know how they're doing. Maybe they're doing bad and they need assistance and maybe you need to tell them what they need to do. Uh, maybe they're doing great and they just need to get that high five and reinforcement. And typically, uh, any raises uh, will be tied to that uh, performance uh, appraisal. Uh, but for managers, don't go in there and just have a laundry list of the bad things that your employee has done throughout the year. Uh, you should be communicating with them early and often, which means that you wouldn't uh, just bring something up and say, hey, I got this long, I have this long list of bad things that you've been doing. You should be addressing those early and often. So communicate early and often and you won't have a bunch of miscommunications. Uh, you know, it's not confrontational. It's just, hey, we're just having a conversation. <clears throat> Uh, and these are, you know, some options, right? So, uh, you know, every company has a different one, but look at punctuality. Uh, the teller is always on time for work and, and promptly opens his or her window. Uh, <clears throat> I would put like agree uh, versus strongly agree because some, you know, everybody's late at least once uh, because it could be anything, right? The freeway could have blown up. Right? So, so <clears throat> you know, you have to watch how you answer these questions, especially on those standardized tests like the Wonderlick and the Myers-Briggs test because they try and trick you and fool you. Um, so the behaviorally anchored, uh, rating scale, right? Just looking, you know, rated by different behaviors. Um, <clears throat> so this right here, uh, is actually pretty interesting. So a job is a specialty, a specialty store manager, uh, dimension inventory control. So always orders in the right quantities and at the right time, that's seven, almost always orders, uh, the right time, but occasionally orders too much or too little. Of a particular item usually orders at the right time and almost uh, in the right quantities right so you go all the way down the list to never orders in the right quantities at the right time that that one is where you definitely don't want to be uh, seven always orders in the right quantities and at the right time that's where you want to be but more realistically it's probably six right so behaviorally anchored rating scale uh, they help overcome some of the limitations of standard rating scales each point on the scale is accompanied by a behavioral anchor, a summary of an employee uh, behavior uh, that fits that spot on the scale, right? 360 degree feedback. Sometimes you have performance evaluation and appraisals that they get information from your manager, from somebody who reports to you, uh, from somebody uh, that's in a different department, all kind of different areas. Uh, it's a performance appraisal system in which managers are evaluated uh, by everyone around them, their boss, their peers, and their subordinates, right? So that can get kind of interesting, kind of fun. Company that I was at, they actually uh, had a had a review for where the employees reviewed the managers, and uh, the managers were, you know, got, got, got kind of butthurt about it and just never, ever did the process again because they didn't like the things that the employees said about them. I said, but hey, you know, you're saying things about the employees, you should be able to, you know, to, you know, uh, take as much as you can give. Uh, compensation, that's us getting paid, and that's uh, one of the most important things because we have families to support and things to buy, right? Uh, financial uh, remuneration, 
uh, given by the organization to its employees in exchange for their work, right? Uh, so, hey, we're going to reward you with this compensation because uh, you've done a great job. Or we're going to tell you that you're not getting a raise because you, you didn't do a very good job and uh, we need for you to do better this time. Uh, so leading the way, holding true at Nucor Steel. This is actually a great story. Uh, I see the Nucor in a number of uh, number of textbooks, uh, but you need to really check out their their story uh, because you know if you're you're in there and look like I mean doesn't this just look really hot in there? Uh, so you know if you're working with steel and things of that nature, it's things are going to be really really hot. Uh, so uh, you need to uh, uh, find a way to to increase employee morale. Uh, if some people are going to be in there in these, you know, heavy jumpsuits and masks and everything, and it's burning up in there, you need to make sure that people are happy because uh, it's very easy to walk away from a job. Although it's, you know, a great pay paying job, uh, you know, the conditions are, are very harsh. So be sure to read that story. Uh, and then leading the way continued. Uh, uh, it's a good story. Like I said, I see it in a lot of different uh, textbooks. Uh, job evaluation is an attempt to assess the worth of each job relative to the other jobs, right? So you want to do a job evaluation. Where do we stack rank these jobs? CEO is the most important and the vice presidents of sales and vice president of marketing. Right. We want to see. We want to do an evaluation on, on what we actually have and what we need to do uh, <clears throat> throughout. Uh, benefits. Right. So for those of you younger, uh, sometimes you don't realize how, how important benefits are and how much they're truly worth. Uh, but benefits are worth a lot in excess of $10,000. Uh, things of value other than compensation uh, that an organization provides to its workers, right? Uh, so benefits means like, uh, you know, insurance benefits. It could also mean like the 401k, all kind of different things uh, uh, fall under benefit category. But these are perks that you get because some companies don't, don't necessarily have to uh, provide those benefits. But if those companies don't provide those benefits, then it's hard for them to attract or recruit the right type of people or individuals. Uh, diversity. Uh, diversity is a characteristic of a group or organization whose members differ uh, from one another along one or more important dimensions such as age, gender, and ethnicity, right? So we want a diverse organization, you know, have all the groups because they have more ideas, the ideas that come from their culture uh, and, and, and really help to enhance the organization, all right? So something that you do in your culture might be something that Doritos can say, hey, you know what, let's do this a little bit differently because uh, it seems to be working for this uh, this other brand. <clears throat> All right, so diversity, be sure to read those, read, you know, read those very carefully because uh, diversity and multiculturalism uh, is a very hot topic these days. Uh, uh, some companies have, have a VP of diversity, VP of inclusion, things of that nature. Those are positions that possibly you could have in the near and distant future. Uh, labor relations is a process of dealing with employees who are represented by a union, right? So if somebody's represented by a union, uh, it's a different uh, dealing process. If I don't have a union, you just deal with me one on one. If I do have a union, then you're gonna have to probably speak with that that uh, that union rep, uh, and that's the reason why a lot of companies uh, don't want unionization because they want to deal with the employee and they feel like they have a better chance of dealing with them one on one as opposed to uh, dealing with uh, the actual union or a actual union. Uh, so I want you to go over this, this unionization process. Uh, be sure to read through it. So, you know, just kind of gives you some some options and this is how you create a union. Uh, if it doesn't work, then it goes off to the left. And there are a couple, you know, key points and key things that you actually need to do uh, <clears throat> in order to form a union uh, for your company. Uh, union organization process, this is a spoke of listed up above. So if employees of an organization want to form a union, the law prescribes a specific set of procedures that both employees and the organization must follow, right? And those are uh, the steps right there uh, that you need to uh, kind of know and examine. Uh, collective bargaining, that is important. Uh, the process of agreeing on a satisfactory labor contract between management and the union, right? So they want to bargain. Collective bargaining is a term. Uh, when they come to agreement, everything's great. Everybody goes to work, doesn't strike. And, uh, and management's happy because, you know, the money continues to roll in. Uh, grievance procedure. Uh, this is uh, a means of a labor contract uh, is enforced. Uh, so if, you, if you, you have a grievance, then you go through your grievance procedure, go to your union rep and say, hey, hey I have a grievance. These are the reasons why. How can we move forward and attempt to resolve this? <clears throat> 
so new challenges in the workplace. There will always be new challenges in the workplace. Uh, knowledge workers or workers who cont whose contributions to an organization are based on what they know, right? Uh, so I've accumulated and amassed this amount of knowledge. Uh, uh, you know, people want to pick my brain in terms of, you know, what I know and how I can en enhance the organization because uh, maybe I've done it elsewhere as well. Uh, we already talked about contingent and temporary workers, uh, you know, trends that, you know, you want someone reliable. Maybe if they're a really good uh, temporary worker, uh, you know, you come to Macy's and you sell the most shoes, uh, then I'm, I want to keep you on as a, as a full-time employee. Uh, or maybe we just part ways in and you just come back uh, next Christmas or next Thanksgiving, after next Thanksgiving. So we're at the very end, a summary of learning outcomes and key points. Be sure to review all of those. They will help you on your quizzes and your upcoming tests, which uh, will be coming, uh, you know, sooner than later. Uh, so that'll be test number two. Uh, so I'll send that out and let you guys know what chapters it's on and uh, when it will be available. But for this week, I'll take your t uh, chapter eight quiz, do your assignment, uh, be sure and not in that order, but uh, because before that, you need to read the chapter, watch the video, watch the supplemental video. Then uh, you can take your quiz and do your assignment, and then uh, you'll, you'll be all done. Uh, so when you'll be done with the class before you know it, as always, these things definitely uh, fly by. Uh, so be sure to go to the summary. It will tie up any loose ends that you may have, and uh, uh, make sure that you all have a good day and a great week.